The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. That is why we are here. That is why we exist. That is why Live Oak Church exists. There are thousands on John's Island from all walks of life in need of the love that can only come through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He may be glorified. We are planted to love God. We are planted to love people. We are planted to live boldly. We are planted and we're just getting started. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 25. We'll be in verses 14 through 30. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. So as I've been uh, praying about this campaign for a while now, weeks and a couple months actually, and just looking and digging through scriptures and uh, what does God have to say to, for us in this moment, in these moments? I came across a passage that I just loved. It comes out of Jeremiah 29, verse 7. It says, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. I love that. Now, in this, in this particular passage, Jeremiah was sent into exile, and so God's like, basically, as you pray to the Lord on its behalf, as, you bless, as, the, the, as the community, as that town, as it is blessed, as it, as it is, when you look after its welfare, you will find your welfare. As you pour into its blessing, you will be blessed. And I thought, how perfect is that verse? This has been the heart of Live Oak Church from the beginning. Not to simply be another church, but to, on the Lord's behalf, seek the welfare of John's Island. I truly believe that John's Island is better with Live Oak Church here than without it. In our three short years, we have blessed hundreds through our yard gift. We have given thousands of dollars to people, churches, and organizations to help spread the gospel. We have raised thousands of dollars for missions, including over $11,000 for Ukrainian refugees. We have seen 27 people baptized into the faith of Jesus Christ and dozens renew their faith. We have seen marriages renewed. We have seen leaders born. We have a stellar family ministry reaching kids and teenagers and developing them into the spiritual leaders of tomorrow. God has blessed, and I think it's safe to say that the experiment that is Live Oak Church is a success. So it's time for us to stop thinking in terms of weeks or years, but of the next generation. It's time for us to plant roots. The next two weeks, we're going to share the dream of building boldly. This campaign is aptly named because, yes, it does include a building a 9,000 to 10,000 square foot building that will have ample space for worship, family ministries, and community opportunities because we don't want to build a building simply to meet in on Sunday mornings, but we want to construct a building that is open for the community that can be used for John's Island. And it's also a bold undertaking because it will take a miracle to make this happen. However, I believe that God still does those. Through God's guidance, we will come out of this campaign not only with property and facilities, but with a renewed faith and belief that we're doing exactly what God's called us to do. So we begin this campaign by defining what biblical stewardship is and how it affects us. Let's jump into the scripture in Matthew chapter 25. For it's going to be like a man on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability, and then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five more. So he who had the two talents made two more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those servants came and settled accounts with him. 
And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered me two talents. I have made two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seeds, so I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and you gather where I scatter no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to he who has a ten talents, for to everyone who has more will be given, and he who has an abundance. But for the one who has not, even that which he has will be taken away, and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, and I pray in these moments, God, that you would open the eyes of our hearts that we may see and hear you. God, I pray that we would be changed, that no one coming in would be the same as when we leave. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so in your, uh, in your roadmaps, in your um, Building Boldly Roadmaps there, there is a page that says Stewardship Sermon Notes. So if you want to follow along, you can fill in the blanks here. Uh, just a couple of things just to, to get us going. Uh, and then after today, there are going to be five stewardship devotionals. So five days of devotions will, which will help you focus your mind, your heart, your spirit on the idea of stewardship. But let's start off by defining stewardship. Stewardship is the care and management of of what belongs to another. It's the care and management of what belongs to another. It's the idea that, you know, what has been given to you, you are in charge of, you're in care of. It's not yours, you're just simply to be, uh, to look over. You know, with the past week's events, you know, we're all uh, kind of focusing on uh, royalty and the whole uh, kings and queens and that kind of thing. Well, I, I think about Uh, castles and I think about the steward of the castle the steward of the castle he is there to manage the accounts of the Lord he's there to manage the accounts of the the Lord of the house he's there to manage the the staff and the resources and that kind of thing that is the steward stewardship is that that same thing the care and management of what belongs to another too often stewardship is just associated with money but biblical stewardship applies to everything we have our time, our talents, and our treasures. Biblical stewardship calls us to use these things for a kingdom purpose. We need to remember that all we have belongs to God. Now, that's hard for us to, it's hard for us to, to imagine. It's hard for us to grasp because it seems that, hey, I work for what I have. I have, you know, my talents. I have talent. I've worked. I'm, I have, you know, to hustle so that I... I am good at my job. I hustle so that I can do and, and grasp the idea that God is the God of the universe. We grasp the idea that God created heaven and the earth. That God is the heavens, is the God of the heavens. He created the earth. He created all that is around us. However, when it comes to my stuff, it's mine. That God can be the God of everything in the universe except what is mine. That seems silly to me. It seems, it seems crazy. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Paul says, For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? In that verse, we see Paul has a message to the church of Corinth that carries a theme throughout his letter and one that we need to hear. What do we have that we haven't received? Our life, 
The very breath we breathe has been given to us, our family. Uh, that's something that's important for us parents to understand that we were blessed with our children, but they are not our own. They belong to God. My son, my daughters belong to God. I am simply a steward of the children God has blessed me with to help manage them, to prepare them for life, and then they are released into the world. I have been given my life. I've been given my family. I've been given the resources. I've been given freedoms, even salvation. I did not do anything to earn it. Even salvation has been given to me. So the big idea for today is in order for Live Oak Church to be good stewards as a church body, we as individuals must be good stewards with what has been given to us. So let's go back and unpack our scripture for today. Let's go unpack the, the passage in Matthew 25. And we, in this passage, we see a few transferable principles. Three things I want us to glean from this passage. Number one, stewardship equals managers, not owners. In this passage, we see that, the, that it was the Lord that the, the called his servants together to entrust him to whose property? His property. He was entrusting them with his property. In other words, the, the stewards, the, 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 the servants, didn't own the five talents, the two talents, and the one talent. They were simply managers of that which they were given. And as we, as we manage the time, talents, and treasures that we have, we need to understand that we're not owners of these resources. We are managers of these resources. Number two, stewardship equals responsibility. Now, I'm going to warn you ahead of time, football reference coming, okay? I promise you, just because football season has started, I'm not going to be like one of those preachers that every week has a football reference. I've, I, I've been under those preachers and it was annoying, but this really fits and so I'm going to use it, all right? So, towards the end of a game, even yesterday, I was watching this game I won't tell you which one in case it depresses you, but a, a team will often use what's called a prevent defense. What this means is the end of the game, basically what they'll do is they'll just hang everybody back so that they will prevent the team from doing anything good. What I hate about this process is that they ab they would be aggressive the whole game and they would be aggressive and they would go after the other quarterback and they'd go and go and go and that got them the win and towards the end of a game instead of continuing that which gave them the lead they decide to hang back and instead of win try not to lose man that that is a horrible way to run a football team and it's a horrible way to run our life I don't ever want to play a prevent defense. Too many of us, we, we surrender our life to Jesus. We got out of hell, and we're, we're okay. All right, now, I don't, I'm not going to hell. I'm, I'm going to heaven. And so the rest of our lives, we basically pray, play a prevent defense. I'm not going to do anything aggressive. I'm just going to hang back and try not to lose. We're just waiting to die so that we can go to heaven and not hell. That's the extent of many people's kingdom mindsets. I don't ever want to play the prevent defense in my life, and I don't ever want to play the prevent defense in our church's existence. I remember in the beginning days how it was like, oh man, if we could only have this, and we would get this, and it's like, all right, now, if we could only have this, we'd only have a place to meet in, and then we got the place to meet in. It's like, okay, if we could only have leaders and we got leaders if we could only have and we kept, kept pushing forward and I always want to push forward I always want to say okay what's next if I ever sit back and say we've arrived let's just chill fire me it's too important because right now there are cars driving by and they don't know Jesus there are cars driving by and in those cars families are falling apart and in those cars, people who are addicted, people who are stuck in addiction, people who are trapped in a life that just doesn't make sense anymore, they have no hope, 
Those people driving by need Jesus. And as long as there's one person on John's Island that needs Jesus, we keep pushing forward. We never settle. We never play the prevent def defense. We never say, okay, we're just going to hang back and pray we don't lose. Why? Because we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to manage God's resources, to manage the time He has given us, to manage the talents He's given us, and to manage, yes, the treasures He's given us. Stewardship equals we're managers, not owners. It equals responsibility. And all, thirdly, stewardship equals accountability. The managers were held accountable. Have you ever gone, have you ever had a job where you had to go in for a review? I, uh, I remember early in my youth ministry years, I had to go in for a review. And our youth ministry was just, we were killing it, man. It, it was, I mean, we were going great. And I walked in, I was, I was a kid, I was like 19 years old. I walked in, I was like, yeah, just tell me how much my raise is, okay? And he sat me down, and he's gone to be with the Lord now, but Ryan Creech was our associate pastor, and he was my direct report. And he just went on a litany of things I had not done right, of things I needed to improve. And every time he went through, my, I sat lower and lower and lower in my seat. And he let me know, listen, this isn't about me knocking you down. It's holding you accountable because I want you to be great. You see, accountability isn't a bad thing. Accountability just lets us know where we are. Accountability just lets us know how we're, how we're doing with what God has blessed us with. The managers were held accountable. We hear two titles, one very, very good, one very, very, very bad. He says, well done, my faithful servant. Well done, my faithful servant. I want to hear that. And I want to hear that you have been faithful over a little. I'm going to set you over much. And I, and I love even the next part. And I'm going to set you over much. Some of us were like, that's just more work. I don't want that. It's the next part that's beautiful. Enter into the joy of your master. That's what I want. I want to be, I want to be faithful for what he's given me because what comes with that is joy of the master. That's title number one. Title number two, wicked and slothful servant. That I don't want. I don't want that title. I don't want to be, God has blessed me, and instead of using it, instead of using the time, talent, and treasure he's given me, instead of, of investing it in kingdom purposes, instead of that, he, I have sat on it and, and is seen by my God as lazy and slothful. The time we have here on earth is so precious. What we do matters. What we invest in matters. What we have faith in matters. We are praying boldly that we would have the courage to be faithful. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 7 says this. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his own heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. As we enter this campaign, you have to pray how you're going to give. I'm not going to guilt you. I'm not going to come after you. I'm not going to send, you know, Guido the killer pimp to come, the brute squad to come after you. We want you to give because you believe that Live Oak Church is supposed to be here. We want you to give because you believe in the vision. We want you to give because you believe in the mission of Live Oak Church. We want you to be a cheerful giver. We want you to decide to give. We want you to say, yes, I'm in. We want you to push your chips in and say, I'm all in because I am gambling. I'm betting on what God is doing here. Guys, we want to build boldly. 
We want to build community. We want to build disciples. We want to build ministry, ministries to those in need. We want to build strong families. We want to build. Now, here. Never know. What I do promise you as a pastor that we will enter into this campaign with open eyes, open hearts, and open hands, clinging to nothing other than to the will of God. Because after all, we are just managers. He is the owner. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the opportunity to come into your house. And I pray, Lord, as we move forward from this day into this next season, that you would stretch our faith. I pray, Lord, that in these days we would see you do amazing things, not only in the church, but in our lives. Do miracles in our lives, God. Do miracles as we strive to do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The one thing that binds us together no matter where we are. The one thing that binds us together whether we're meeting here, whether we're meeting in a school, whether we're meeting in another building, whether we're meeting in a tent, whether we're meeting in life groups, wherever we meet, one thing that binds us together is the gospel. One thing that binds us together is what Jesus did on the cross. One thing that binds us together is his love for us and that, that ecclesia, that is a, the Greek word for church, which means a holy gathering. That gathering together is holy because of what Jesus did in and through us. And so as we come together weekly, we do so to remember what Jesus did. And this, this communion, this coming together at the table is what binds us together. So let's pray as we prepare to come to the table. Lord, if any of us came in here today, holding on to pride. Come now.
So one thing I knew as we entered into this uh, capital campaign is that I was going to need uh, a campaign director, that I would need to focus on leading our church spiritually, leading our vision. I didn't want to be bogged down with the numbers and talking about money because I don't want to. Um, and uh, so um, we prayed over several names, but one uh, that really rose to the top very quickly is uh, Tom Ritzert. And I'm going to ask Tom to come up now. Tom is the perfect choice for this for a couple of different reasons. One, his experience uh, in leadership in, uh, uh, in a church that he served in uh, out west, uh, but also his experience in the corporate field. Uh, big numbers don't intimidate him, you know, and uh, talking to people who have big numbers don't intimidate him and that kind of thing. Uh, but more importantly, uh, his love for Jesus and his love for Live Oak Church uh, just just reeks out of him, comes out of him, is very um, evident in his life. And so uh, he and his wife agreed to help take this on. And uh, so he will be the one really um, keeping us updated on how the finances are going and how uh, all the details of the nitty-gritty stuff is going on. And so I've asked him to come and give us kind of the, um, the details of what's needed. So, Tom. Good morning, everyone, and uh, just a privilege to uh, take on this task uh, to serve Live Oak and to serve God's mission here on John's Island. So our first song this morning, ha the line talks about God <coughs> does great things, and I think this is a perfect example of God doing great things uh, to further our mission here on John's Island. And, you know, whatever that building or whatever it actually looks like in the end is exactly what God wants it to be. And as I said, God can do great things, and but God also uses us to do many of those great things. Now, um, just to get down, as Sean said, into the nitty-gritty of things, what we're looking at to purchase property, to build a building, or to find another permanent home, whatever that path leads us down, it's going to take a uh, fairly substantial amount of resources. So I'll just share the numbers that we've discussed as a leadership team and, and where we think uh, we need to be. So the figure that uh, we've determined that's gonna require us to make all this happen is $2 million. Now, your reaction to that number could be not as much as I expected or how the heck are we gonna get there? Um, how we're gonna get there could happen a number of ways. God could create a miracle, it could just happen. One of you could write a check for $2 million. I'll bring the pen <laughs> if, you, if somebody <laughs> wants to do that. Um, that's probably not likely, nor does that allow all of you to be part of this. So it will take all of our, um, all of our efforts, all of our giving, all of our hearts to make this happen. So let me share a few numbers just so you kind of understand where we need to be. So. Sean and Travis and others, myself, have looked around at property on John's Island. Sean's looking constantly for options, both land and, and building. But it looks like land is probably our most uh, expedient way to make this happen. And, you know, to, we're going to be out of this facility in about a year or so. Our timeline actually has already started. So uh, to find a piece of property that, you know, a couple acres or more that we think we would need is going to take around... Uh, you know, 300,000, 350, 400,000, maybe even a little bit more. Now, we don't need all that money immediately, but we do need a down payment. We do know that we can get financing and that we can, you know, pay a mortgage like most of us do, um, but we're going to need between 70 and 90 thousand dollars raised to purchase land. That's a much more doable number, especially I know the giving heart that uh, Live Oak has. To do the building part of it, we need for a down payment, we need around $300,000. Again, that seems like a large number for any individual to uh, contribute, but collectively, I know we can, we can get there. So I've given you two key numbers. How do you respond? How do you respond to that? Well, Sean mentioned you know, praying about it, the devotionals. There's a, a testimony in here from members of our church that I, is very impactful. I encourage you to read that. Think about you know, what you can do to be part of this effort. Pray about what you can uh, 
do to be part of this effort. Just some ways to uh, uh, go forward. If you are not currently giving regularly, just start giving regularly. Make a commitment to give regularly. If you are giving regularly, up that giving to tithing regularly. And if you're already tithing, see you know, what's in your heart about giving above and beyond. And so we're asking for two things. One, is there a lump sum that you could just provide right out the gate? Make a commitment to providing a lump sum. Secondly, is there an additional amount that you can commit to for the next 12 months to build this, this fund that we need to, to move forward? Now, this may require sacrificial giving. Um, in the, this booklet, there's uh, just some ways, you know, some are, can you give up a Starbucks once, <coughs> twice a week? Can you give up a meal out, you know, once a week and stay home? Uh, doing a staycation rather than a vacation. So for some of us, it will be a matter of just pulling out resources from our savings. For others of us, it may require not being able to do something in order to be able to do this. And so whatever your situation is, God will put it on your heart for what he's asking you to do. So one thing I will ask you to do is after thoughtful consideration, after prayer time, after sharing with your family and thinking about it, if a number comes into your mind, I ask to challenge you, add 25% to that number. Let's really get out there. Let's try and stretch ourselves to make this really happen, um, to make ourselves uh, a permanent home here on um, John's Island. So as far as the process, in your booklets, there's a little card. Looks like this. There's a white section, there's a blue section. Next week, we're going to ask you to take the white section and drop it in the offering bucket. This is your commitment going forward. Then the little blue piece, we ask you to hang on to and continue to pray over. And, you know, if for some reason this week isn't the week you can make that decision, maybe it's next week or the week after. But I'll be in contact with you sharing the updates and status of, of our campaign, but also to offer encouragement and, uh, you know, help you through this process as needed. So, again, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to uh, answer questions later. Um, Sean will speak to that, but I just ask each of individually to uh, think about how you can participate in this uh, in this effort. Thank you very much. <laughs>